So I remember when I first got into mindfulness, it was about two years ago. It was a very bright, sunny, beautiful day in LA, and I was grumpy. And uh, I was grumpy despite having practiced yoga in the morning with my wife, uh, walked around downtown South Pasadena, cooked a wonderful dinner, and I was grumpy because I didn't get to check enough things off of my to-do list. Um, and I remember this one statement that my wife said to me at the time, which was, you know, you don't always have to be doing things. You don't always have to be checking things off your list. And that was the aha moment that I needed to kind of wake up. And it was at that time my wife was a graduate student at USC, and uh, she had a little bit more time on her hands than I did. Um, and she started reading John Kabat-Zinn's book, uh, Full Catastrophe Living, and started meditating. And that was her introduction and her for first foray into meditation. That became my introduction. And the hard part moving forward was always figuring out how do you practice, finding ways to practice, especially in a really hectic, busy um, life that, that we lead. And so what I want to share with you today is that along my path, I've discovered three small things that I've done to help me be a little bit more mindful every day, uh, create a, a more compassionate environment, and just express more compassion to the people around me. So the first thing that I had, question I had was, how do I stay present when days are hectic, right? And thinking about the place that you are most present is when you are on vacation, right? And maybe you're at the beach, and maybe you're reading a book on mindfulness, and maybe the, the book on mindfulness says something like, appreciate the present moment, be present. And it's so easy when this is what you look at. <laughs> and maybe the book says, you know, accept the things the way they are, and you look and you see the umbrella slightly to the left, but you're gonna accept that. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna accept that, that's fine. But the hard part is when you get back to work and this is what you deal with. Um, this is actually my schedule from February 2nd to February 8th. Um, and, and how can you be mindful when you have to be planning for the next thing over, all the time, right? Um, and going back to work after a vacation, you drive to work and this is what you see, a beautiful road, you kind of, your, your mind is clear. But after a few days going back to work, things start, your, your chatter starts to come back and you start wondering things, and your vision gets clouded by all these questions of what do I do, what am I doing today, um, do I have dinner plans, what's going on? Um, and it was, I tried a bunch of things, and I found one thing that really worked for me, uh, and I called it mindful planning. And it feels really contradictory, right? How can you be mindful in the present when you're thinking about the future? Uh, but it works. It's, it's that if every day I try to take a little bit of time to sit there and be present with the fact that I'm planning for the future. And ironically, that makes me more present then, and it makes me more present during that day, right? So how does this work? Start off the day with a cute dog um, and my iPhone. And before I head off to work, I look at my calendar. And I do a little bit what I call the calendar scan. So if you're familiar with a body scan, it's just like that, but not with your body, <laughs> with your calendar. And so for each item, I go through and think about, like, what's the context of this meeting that I'm going to go into? What are the goals? What am I trying to get out of it? What, what's the mutual, uh, uh, what's the best outcome? Is there anything I need to do to prepare? Oftentimes, it's like sending out an agenda, right? Um, and after I scan every single item one by one, um, I can go and look for the entire day. Am I missing anything? Should I postpone anything? Should I add any other meetings? And so by doing this, bit by bit, I take out all of the little mindless chatter that I have when I'm driving to work. And when I'm sitting there in a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I don't have to be wondering, man, what's next? Did I prepare for what's next? I'll know that, like, I've already done that. It's gone. And this takes less than 10 minutes per day. It's very, very simple. It also works on weekends. Uh, if your mind thinks, like, in, in, in terms of to-do lists, like mine does, um, it just takes 10 minutes to think about, like, what are my intentions for the day? What do I want to accomplish? Do I have any appointments? Am I meeting uh, up for lunch with anyone? And just knowing what's coming up next is going to put you more in the present moment. Great. So, the second thing, how do I surround myself with like-minded people? Um, chances are you don't spend your days alone. You probably go to work, or maybe you're running errands or on the weekends. You're spending time with people. Right. And it's been said in a lot of uh, practices that, you know, 
taking refuge in people who are like-minded, who will help you on your path, will make you more mindful. So surrounding yourself with people who are more mindful will make you more mindful. But it's also like pretty obvious that you can't change other people to be more mindful. You can't hope to change other people. It's going to be like kind of a fool's errand. Um, and that's not what I set out to do. But what you can do is you can meet them where it matters, which is language. And language is the one thing that you guys share, what you guys talk about creates this space, right? And that's some, one thing you can control. Um, language is incredibly powerful. It, it affects the way that we think. It affects the way that we behave. There have been studies that show this. So if you come from a language like English that has a division between blue and green along a certain spectrum, uh, or if you come from a language in Russian, like Russian, where the division is slightly different, it actually changes the way you perceive color. And the uh, response time that you have for certain tasks categorizing the colors will be different depending on what language you grew up with. So a language really does affect the way you think. So putting this into practice, for me, I try to practice intentional language every time I, I, I talk to people. And that just means being more thoughtful about what my intentions are, choosing my words very cl uh, clearly and carefully, and trying to create a space with the words that I use. So, very simply, identifying an opportunity to be more thoughtful. Pausing, asking yourself, what is my intention in this moment? What am, what am I trying to accomplish with my language? Picking the right words that satisfy that intention, and then speaking. So, how this works. At Facebook, we name our conference rooms after various themes. It's kind of fun, right? So, uh, one group of conference rooms is called, uh, basically named after hard engineering problems. So, if you're an engineer, you would have heard of the, 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 the problem of the traveling salesman. So, that's one of the rooms. So, I moved into a new part of the office, and I discovered this room as the room that I, you know, was near, close to. And I didn't know what it was. Trollolo, not sure what it is. Googled it, it's a meme. It's an internet meme, okay? And so I was, I was in a, um, an area of the office where all the conferences were, were named after memes, and that's great, that's great, except for the fact that the room that I used for all my one-on-ones and the place where I spent most of my time was called You Mad Bro. So imagine going into a meeting with your manager for the first time to discuss you know, you know, your goals, and you're going to go to a room called You Mad Bro, right? Or you're going, and per, uh, going to maybe receive your perfor performance review, like we were just talking about, and you just thought, like, yeah, where are we going? We're going to go in, you know, You Mad Bro. Like, that's, that's the space that we created. So I put in a request to get that name changed, just because I don't think that's the type of person that I wanted, uh, the, the space I wanted to create. And I changed the name to This Moment. So, uh, I could actually say things like, you know, where are we meeting? We're going to meet in this moment. Um, this is incredibly cheesy, I know, but I love it. It's, it's, so, it's so fun. Uh, so I named my room this moment, um, which is great. Um, and while I'm trying to be more mindful, I'm also mindful for the, about the fact that I'm oftentimes not punctual. You can ask my wife, you can ask my coworkers. I'm just not good with time. So I'll oftentimes be late, but, I, but actually what's interesting is that when I'm there, um, I just feel a little bit more present. It's just like a little reminder to myself to be in this moment, right? Um, and when I'm running late, I get some hilarious texts from my coworkers. Uh, for example, it says, in this moment. Just like waiting for me four minutes late. I'm just thinking like, that's great, you just stay there, just stay there, that's good. Um, uh, I actually, many people have texted me this, this is not hard for me to find this. Um, uh, but you can have a lot of fun with this, of course, and, and I'll be there soon, and just send a thumbs up, and I'll be like, I'm here now. Um, so little things in language will change the way you, th you think, will change the way you interact with your, your coworkers, um, and that's intentional language, something that you can practice. So the last part is, how can you practice more compassion every day? Hectic lives, we, we, we kind of run from one thing to the other, you know, we're um, going to meetings, we're going home, we're rushing from, one, uh, from work to home, etc. And in this busyness, it's so simple, it's so easy to have compassion for your loved ones. It's really easy to have compassion for your family, your parents, and also your really good friends. But what about having compassion for that person that's on the street that you just pass by? How do you open your, up your heart a little bit more to more people 
How can you seek to understand just more people in the world? And for that, um, I've had some help and uh, a lot of help, and a lot of this actually goes to, um, credit goes to my friend Brandon. This is Brandon. Um, Brandon, in 2010, lived in Chicago. He worked as a bond trader, and he was let go from his job. Um, and uh, he decided he wanted to do something completely different, so he said, I'm going to do photography. And his parents were like, you're not going to make any money. You know, it's kind of a weird path to go on. But he was really determined. So he decided to go to visit different cities and uh, take photos and just see where that led him. The first city he went to was Pittsburgh. Walked around, took some photos. And then as he was uploading these to Facebook, he thought like, well, how can I title this album? What's the common theme through all these photos? And he called this photo album Yellow Steel Bridges. And then uh, he took to, went to the next city, which is Philadelphia. Same thing, walked around, took photos of things, um, saw the sites, and he uploaded to Facebook, and he thought, really, the common theme between all these photos is bricks and flags. So he called it bricks and flags. Next, he went to New York. He thought about staying for a little bit of time, wanted to go and uh, uh, check out New York, take some photos, started taking photos, found some interesting sights and sounds, uh, and he was going to upload it to Facebook, uh, and he realized the common theme that really inspired him through all of these photos was the people. So he called this album Humans of New York. And um, fast forward three and a half years, it's, uh, it's a page on Facebook. Uh, just crossed over three million likes on this page, uh, and I had the privilege of watching him work uh, last summer when I visited New York. And he walks around the city of New York and he, and he asks people, can I take your picture? Um, and he sometimes goes to Grand Central Station, goes to different neighborhoods in New York. And for different people, he'll, he'll present himself a little bit differently. He tells me that like, you know, when he goes and walks up to a, a nice la uh, young lady or a, uh, he goes and kind of kind of cowers a little bit and says, hey, can I take your picture? And then when he goes into Harlem or goes into Brooklyn, he goes like, hey, hey can I take your picture, you know? Like, uh, just try to appeal to his audience. But he goes around, takes people's pictures, and asks them a few questions, like, what is the biggest challenge you're facing? Or what are you most afraid of? Um, what's one most difficult thing in your life? And from that, he queues up all these photos and all these stories, and he posts multiple times a day to Facebook these portraits of people and their story told in their own words. It's really fascinating the amount of compassion that we find on this page. Within minutes of each of these posts going up, he has tens of thousands of likes, thousands of reshares. And the comments on this page are so incredibly compassionate it's hard to believe this is the internet. <laughs> um, and uh, the people offering support, and, and people just are very clearly like, oh, that's me, that, that story reminds me of me. Or I know someone like that. And then you start seeing people on the street a little bit differently. You start wondering, what is their story, right? Like this guy, this guy that you might run into the subway. He talks about how his father is, is battling Alzheimer's. Or this guy who lost all of his life savings to a guy who was investing, and then subsequently his wife left him for that guy. Or this man who you meet in a subway station who's trying to spend more time with his second child here because he didn't spend enough time with his first child. And he goes on to talk about how his first child had autism and he was young and he was scared and he didn't know how to handle that, so he just ran away. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a story, and just by, by subscribing to this page, liking this page on Facebook, I've been able to just open my eyes to just like see all these people around me have stories. And it's been really touching, it's been life-changing. Um, this past uh, month, we went back to New York, and I noticed that when I rode the subway, I no longer looked down, I just started looking up. And I looked up and I looked at everyone who was on the train, I looked at everyone who I passed on the street, and I just tried to understand them just a little bit better. And it's just that kind of compassion that came with just uh, um, following humans in New York on Facebook and Instagram. And I spend a lot of time on Facebook and Instagram. It's for my job. It's not, you know, <laughs> I work there. Um, but it's amazing how much something like this can be such a, a bite-sized way to practice compassion and change the way that you have, have outlooks. 
so that's it. These are my three little morsels of practice that I, that I have um, throughout, uh, throughout the day. It just starts with mindful, mindful planning in the mornings, 10 minutes. You can do it after meditation. You can do it before you go to work. It really helps. And I know it helps because I'm not perfect and I don't practice it every day. And the days that I don't practice it, I'm just slightly more disorganized uh, and I just don't feel with it. And I know it helps because on the days I do practice it, there's one day that I had 18 back-to-back -back meetings and I left the office feeling so energized and, and I, it, it did not drain me at all. Secondly, I practice in, um, intentional language. I think a lot about what kind of culture I want to create at work. I think a lot about how do we want to incorporate uh, certain values. Um, we kick off every Monday morning at Instagram with a product planning meeting. And it was such a slight little word choice, but instead of calling it and, and talking to all the product managers like, hey, what are your goals for the week? What are you trying to hit? What numbers are you trying to hit? Um, I started saying, what are your intentions for the week? Really small shift in language, but instead of thinking of it as like, I failed to hit my goals, it's more like, this is what I intend to do, and I will try my very best to try to hit that. Um, and it's worked pretty well. And lastly, Humans of New York. It's so simple. How many of you guys are on Facebook? I don't believe you. How many of you guys are on Facebook? There you go. Thank you. How many of you guys are on Instagram? It's, it's, it's so easy to just follow this one account and be able to just uh, get little bites of compassion throughout the day. Um, and I hope some of these things have spoken to you, and maybe you guys will try some of these things. But most importantly, I hope that you guys find something that works for you. Because in these hectic, this hectic world that we live in and, and the, the busy lives that we lead, it's, off, it's really hard to find time to make time for practice. But um, you'll find a way. So good luck on your path, and thank you guys for your time. <laughs>